hope that you guys understand the, the, the amazingness that is our pastor. Um, I'm not just saying it because I get paid by him. I'm saying it because growing up in here, I, I never want to take it for granted who he is. I want to be like him when I, when I grow up because he's been walking with the Lord for, I think, 40 years now? 44 years, and it's only getting better for him. He's going up, and that's not something that you see very often in leadership. So thank you, Pastor, for who you are. So a lot of people are asking if I'm nervous tonight. I'll just put it this way. I got one more gray hair today than I did yesterday. I found it right here. Um, so, yeah, I'd say a little bit. I, I used to teach in the children's ministry. I did for about 10 years, but it was different. We had puppets, and Pastor won't let me bring a puppet up here. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm excited. And so what I want to turn, what I want to talk about, you know, I was thinking about a story from when I taught in kids ministry. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I started out teaching, it was the first through third class with my mom, who is now our executive pastor. So we were teaching about Samuel. And you all know the story about Samuel getting called by the Lord. He was sleeping and then he heard the voice say, Samuel, come. You all know the story. So we were talking about that. And one of our students, who may or may not have been a cousin of mine, he raises his hand and he says, Aunt Tamira, I had something like that happen to me one time. Really? What happened? Well, I was sleeping, and I heard a voice say, Noah, come forth. And this kid's eight. And it's just, it's funny. We laugh about it, but he said, the voice said, Noah, come forth. So I went and said, yes, Dad, is that you? No, that wasn't me. Noah went back to sleep. Here's it again. Noah, come forth. Yes, Father? No, it's not me. Noah, go back to bed. It happens again. Dad says, No, it's not me. That might be the voice of God. So Noah goes back to sleep, and he hears it again. Noah, come forth. He says, yes, Lord. Now, this was an eight-year-old kid. We know that's not what was happening. He was just making that up because it was funny. I don't know. We laugh. Um, But I was thinking about it, and how many of you have ever, I've been like that, where maybe I thought I heard the voice of God, and I didn't. Or maybe I did hear the voice of God, and I didn't recognize it. So what I want to talk about tonight is actually hearing the voice of God. So the message is called Return to the Ancient Path. And it comes from Jeremiah 6, verse 16, where it says, Thus says the Lord, stand by the road and look, ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and then walk in it, and there you'll find rest for your souls. So let's pray. Well, Father God, I thank you that we've had an opportunity to come gather together tonight, God. I ask you. Just that as I speak, Father God, that it's your words that come from my lips, God, and that anything that I want to say that's not of you, God, that you would just seal my lips so that I can't say it. I ask that, that with this message, God, that we all just have our, our hearts open, our minds open, our ears open, that we could hear from you clearly tonight. In Jesus' name. So, as a Christian, it's really easy with a public walk with Christ for us to almost treat it like a game of chess. And what I mean by that is this. You ever had somebody try to trap you with a question? That, that happens. I see it on the internet all the time. Like, what does the Bible say about, just for example, because it's a hot topic today, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Okay, well, you tell them what the Bible says, and they're like, ah, oh, but wait, they pull out one of the deep cuts from deep that nobody really knows about, like Leviticus 19.19, where it says, don't wear clothes that are made from two different types of cloth. I'm like, I'm wearing denim, and I'm wearing not denim. Um, so I probably would have failed at that one, I'm sure. So they'll pull out those verses, and it's like, well, how do you weigh the two? Which, you know, is it okay for me to wear what I'm wearing now? I hope so. Pastor, I hope that's all right with you. Um, but on the same token, is it wrong for me to commit adultery or to commit murder? How do, how do I weigh the two? So that's what I want to talk about when we talk about returning to the ancient path and with hearing from God. So I want to start at the beginning. You all know where the beginning is. It's Genesis. It's all the way at the front. Um, that's where we're going to start. So you all know how creation happened. What did God do? He spoke. Yeah, you all could help me out. He, he spoke. He spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light. And then all of a sudden, the sun just took form. And then he said, okay, let there be water. And then the water took form. It was everything that he did, he spoke it into existence. And I don't think he sounded like, was it Ben Stein, the clear eye commercial guy, where he said, let there be light. I think he was excited when he spoke it. 
that's, I imagine that was one of the most beautiful things for someone who could have witnessed that. I would love to have been there and watched God just speak it into existence. So he spoke, and then what happened? Creation listened. See, the, the trees listened. He said, let there be pine trees, and then there are pine trees that could throw their pollen all over our cars. It listened, and it listened gratefully. It wasn't like hesitant, like, you know, I don't want to be a rock. I want to be, I want to be a lizard. Like, it wasn't like, it wasn't hesitant to listen. It just did it. It took the shape that he wanted it to. And that's how it's supposed to be with us, where we, we, we listen like that. So that's the proper chain of events. It's God speaks, creation listens, and then God said, it, it is good. It is good that what he created listened to him. That's, that's the order. And when he said it is good, it's like man responds to what God says by, by listening. And it's almost like, like worship. You know, God likes to hear us talk. Did y'all know that? I'm not a fan of my own voice. And honestly, I'd rather be in solitude sometimes and have to listen to a whole bunch of people. I like conversation. But after a while, it starts to, I'm just like, okay, I've, I've heard enough words for the day. I just need to go lay down for a minute. And God's not like that. He likes to hear us talk. And I'll tell you how I know that. I've got it right here. Genesis 2.26, it talks about when God had created the animals and he had created man. He brings all the animals. He gathers them up and brings them all before Adam so that Adam could name them. See, he wanted Adam to describe his creation. That's like worship. That's what worship should be. We live a lifestyle that describes who God is through our lifestyle. Right? That's, that's the chain of events. God creates Creation responds, man worships. That's the proper chain of events. So that's all going well and good. It lasted for probably a few days. And then y'all know what happened next? Yeah, so Adam and Eve, they listen to someone that they shouldn't have. Another voice shows up. So I'm going to read, and I want you to listen to all the voices that are in these passages. The first one is Genesis 2. And it's verse 15 through 17. It says, the Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat from it, you will certainly die. Whose voice? It's the voice of God. So that's voice one. Then we go to the next chapter, Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say... You must not eat from any tree in the garden. I'm going to pause it because that's not even what God said. He said you could eat from any tree in the garden. So straight away, whose voice was that? He inverted what God was saying. All right. So then the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God said you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. I'm going to come back to that. And you must not touch it or you will die. Whose voice? It was Eve's. So I'm just going to say the voice of man, the voice of flesh, the voice of mankind, because all of us have been that at some point. So, uh, myself included, I'm, you know, I'm, this is fleshly, probably more fleshly than some of y'all, have, but I've, I've been there, and I, you know, I'm so grateful for where God has me now, and where God's going to take me. I don't ever want to look back to where that was, but at one point, that was me. So, he, Eve said, God said, you cannot eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. So I, I was reading this this morning, and it stuck out a little bit extra in the middle of the garden. So if I'm in here, and somebody's asking me, hey, Isaiah, where's the keyboard at? What am I going to say? Well, it's right here. I'm not going to say it's over there on the stage because I'm on the stage. So it's implied that this, this is kind of a, a weird concept. I've never heard it like this before, but it stuck out to me. She said, I cannot eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. So she wasn't in the middle of the garden. That's implied. All right, so then the serpent said, you will not certainly die. See, again, he's twisting what God said. You won't certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Again, whose voice? The serpent, the voice of the enemy. And then when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, there wasn't a physical voice speaking there, but whose voice was reasoning it out? The voice of man, the voice of flesh. 
So notice that the location in that verse has changed. Now all of a sudden they're in the middle of the garden where the fruit is. So there was a time between when the serpent decided to speak to them and when they ended up in the garden eating from the tree. What happened in that time? They let that third voice that wasn't supposed to be there set in. And therein was the problem. So then we go a few hours later, and you guys know what happened. It's the very first spring fashion event where now all of a sudden there's clothes. It looked like something Kanye West might have worn. We like Kanye, but he does wear some funny stuff. And so we know what happens next. As he was accustomed to Yahweh, you all know who Yahweh is. That's God. That's the, vo- that's the name that God told us. That's he, he revealed himself through that name. It means the maker of everything that has been made, creator of all. That's Yahweh. Yahweh was walking through the garden, and we could debate this. I don't know. I wasn't there when this was written. But I think it was in physical form that he came by because it says, you could hear him strolling through the, it said he was strolling through the garden in the, the evening breeze. If you could hear somebody walking, the assumption is that, you know, they're there in physical form. May not have been, but that's how I want, that's what I want to go with. So God's walking through the garden in physical form. Now, y'all know who God is, right? He knows everything. They weren't able to pull one over on him, right? He knew what had happened. So y'all know, like, I don't know if you have a daughter or a sister or if you were a little girl at some point. I can't relate to it, but I saw this happen, so I'm going to tell on one of them. When I was, I was little, my sister, I won't say who it was, Hannah, she was probably, <laughs> she was probably two or three, so it was just cute. It was funny. Mom gets home from work, and she goes into her room, and there's Hannah, and she's got lipstick all over her face. It was cute. It was funny. Don't kill me, but it was cute. It was funny. What are you doing, Hannah? Oh, nothing. Were you in my makeup? No. And she's got lipstick all over her face. Like, I imagine that's kind of what this might have looked like, but there was more grief than that because what had just happened was God knew what happened, and yet Adam and Eve were still trying to hide. But the grief was because they had just done something really bad that would separate all of us from God to the extent that Adam and Eve were able to walk with him in the garden. So that was the ancient path where they would walk with him in the garden. God asks two questions when he shows up. And these two questions, when you think about it, these really, really reveal the heart of the father. He didn't say, why'd you do it? He didn't say, why were you thinking? He didn't say, how could you ever be so stupid? He said, where are you? God knew where they were. He says, where are you? Why? This is the heart of the father. When we mess up, he wants us to be able to go to him freely. That's the heart of the Father. That's why he asked that. I love that. It makes me emotional because I think about all the times I messed up and how I didn't go to God freely when he was there with open arms saying, where are you? Identify yourself. Where are you at right now? I don't want to cry. I don't cry. But the next question is even more so important, I think. He doesn't say, what were you thinking? He doesn't say, why'd you do it? He says, who told you that you were naked? See, he doesn't, he's not, God isn't the accuser. The accuser is the enemy. When God comes forward, he wants you to identify where you're at. He wants you to show who you've been listening to, but he's not there to accuse you. He's there to restore you and bring you back. So he says, who told you? And that's where they identify that third voice. The serpent, the woman you gave me, that's what, that's what Adam says, when he was just as complicit. I mean, if you're the driver for a bank robber, you're just as guilty. It's not, yeah, we're not going to act like he didn't do it. But that's the problem. That's the original sin. See, the sin wasn't that they ate from the tree of good and evil, because that would deny the heart of who God is. God's not just someone who makes rules. The sin was that they listened to a voice that wasn't God. They put more weight in the voice of a serpent than they put in God's. How many times have I done that? A lot. That, that's what we have a tendency. We put more weight in the voice of others than we do the voice of God. And that's exactly what sin is. See, sin is a simple concept. It's not doing this. It's not not doing that. That's not what sin is. That's how sin manifests. But what sin is, is when you don't listen to what God says to do, 
by doing something he said not to do or by not doing something he says to do. Sin is when you listen to another voice, whether that's the voice that's in your head that not one that you have to go see a doctor for, but one that's like, hey, Isaiah, you could watch that TV show. You can go to that website. Hey, it'd be okay if you take one drink. That's fine. Now, it doesn't say it's all bad, but you don't see. See, we use a word called the akarit. Pastor told us about it. Cameron's talked about it up here, and Joshua might have talked about it up here, where you could see the beginning from the end. We don't see the beginning from the end because we're not all-knowing like God is. That's why it's so important to trust him because the simplest decision that we make right now, we don't see where that could take us in the future. That's why we have to trust in God with every single step. So that's what sin is. And we put more weight in the voices and desires of others than in him. So you'll know the voice of God. It's pretty cool. Have you all ever seen the dog whisperer? I haven't, but I know what it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I could sum it up. The guy, has a, he, he could charm a dog. He, could, he knows exactly what to say, exactly what to do to make that dog straighten up. Well, God's kind of like the people whisperer. See, he knows exactly what to say because he created everything by saying a word. He knows exactly what to say to us when we need to hear it. I think about the time in 2018, I had we were, some of the staff were at Myrtle Beach. And this was one of the most significant encounters. With, I'm not going to tell you what he said, but this is one of the most significant encounters I've ever had with God. Where he spoke to me, and he told me some things that I needed to hear about myself because I was not in a good place. And there are things I, I didn't believe in myself. And I saw myself how the enemy wanted me to see myself. I didn't see myself how God wanted me to see myself. So when God spoke to me, that completely changed. Two words that he gave me, that was it. See, that's, that's the nature of the voice of God. One word can change your life forever. But he doesn't yell. See, pastor said I'm a quiet guy. Well, I think God's probably even quieter sometimes. He doesn't have to be. God could yell if he wanted, but he has yet to yell at me. Um, sometimes he, he whispers. That's why I said the people whisper. Why does he whisper? Why is it so hard sometimes to hear the voice of God? Here's why. Because God wants you to listen for him. See, he speaks softly. He's going to speak softer than the quietest voice that you have in your life. He's going to speak softer than that spouse that's saying, hey, time to do this. Or than the boss that says, hey, I need you to do this. Or than, than the TV that says, hey, come be entertained for 12 hours a day. Um, binge watching is a thing. <laughs> I've, I've done it. Not, not that much. But I've, I've binge watched where I could be spending time with God. This is where it hits me. I could be spending this time with God. But instead, I'm listening to the voice of celebrities that don't care about me, that really don't even like God. They, they blaspheme his name. Am I going to listen to their voice more than I'm listening to the voice of God? It's a big question. I know it's kind of heavy. But that's, that's sin. I mean, I'm putting more stock in these voices. So God whispers because he wants you to have to listen for him. He speaks soft. So what happens next? After the, after the falling away, after Adam messed up, the curse comes. And this is something else that's really interesting in the story. I'm really hoping I get through all my notes because I'm really close to the top and I don't need to be. But that's good. I'll, I'll just I'll go where I'm going. So we'll get there when it hits 8 o'clock. Um, <laughs> what happens next is the curse comes. And notice, if you go back through and read, because I've read this a lot of times, a whole, a whole bunch it's one of the, the Bible story, the classic Bible story, the story of creation. That's like the first one you hear about in kids' ministry. But I was reading it, and just recently, God didn't put a curse on man. Did y'all ever notice that? The curse was on the serpent, the voice that man shouldn't have been listening to. And he gave woman a hard childbearing. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll leave that one there because I'll never have to go through that. Thank the Lord. Um, but he doesn't curse man. He says, because of what you did, the ground is cursed. Now, there's so much weight. You can see so much emotion in this from the Father. He says, because of what you did, the ground is cursed. Because of what you did, I can no longer walk that path with you. See, God knows, God is holy. He knows that if he was, if he was to step into this room right now, like he did, in the, like I think he did in the garden, if like, you know when they t the guy touched the ark, it was falling, he touched the ark, and he just burned up like that? If he was to step into that room, that would probably happen to us. 
that's just the nature of the manifest, the physical presence of God. He said, because of what you did, Adam, you can't experience me walking with you like that. That's tough. Like, I, th- I think about that. That's, they just, they lost everything. So that was the weight of God. Because you did this, Adam, the ground is cursed. See, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's why. Because outside of the presence of God, death is imminent. How could a loving God send people to hell? Well, he doesn't. We're going to hell, and God pulls us out of, he, he rescues us on the path. He doesn't send us there. Sin, hell is the absence of the presence of God. That is the worst thing I could ever imagine. It's not, I mean, ask me about it later, but the presence of God was in my truck when I was driving here, and that intervened, and the result of me getting here would be different had it, the presence of God not been there. When the presence of God is there, there is life. Right? So that's what, that's what man led onto the earth. And God was, he didn't like that. He wasn't satisfied, though. See, because you look at all the men in the Bible, the ones that had a good walk with God, the ones that had a bad walk with God. The ones who started well and ended well versus the ones that started well and did not end well. You look at all these people in the Bible, and some of them have one thing in common. They listen daily with God, to God. They walk daily with God. That's where I want to be. You look at Elijah and Enoch. Enoch, I don't know how you want to say it. Um, can't speak the language. Can't speak American. But they walked with God so closely that God, they, they didn't even die. God just came and scooped them up and took them to heaven. You look at Moses who walked a lengthy walk. And there when he started to not put as much weight in what God was saying, that's when he didn't see the promised land. But he made it really far. And Abraham, who was able to walk with God, before he had a means of getting freed from his sin, he was able to get 50 years on a word from God because his faith was there. He walked wanting to please the Father. Then you look at people like Samson. Samson is such a tragic story to me because he did not finish well. Yeah, when he died, he killed more people than he had ever killed before combined, but he didn't finish well. That wasn't a good way for him to go out. And he had the full power of God on his shoulders where he could kill a thousand people with a with a bone like I maybe in Call of Duty I could do that but not not in my present form <laughs> I'm not someone that's going to go take on a thousand Philistines that, that's not me but it's because he didn't he didn't put that much emphasis in what God was saying he didn't he didn't honor that walk you know Jesus was the greatest example for us he walked that out every day see so many instances in the Bible. So you can go through and find them. I don't have time to go through all of them. But Jesus would go through and he would, he would pray every morning. He said he would go to the Mount of Olives and pray. When he was in Jerusalem, he went to the Mount of Olives. He was on his knees praying. He was talking to the Father. Right? If Jesus did it, so should we. Now here's a really interesting thing that I found this week. I thought this was so cool. So the fall of man happened where? In the garden. Right? Okay. Y'all know where um, the Garden of Gethsemane is? It's in Mount Olives, not Mount of Olives. Same place. So when Jesus was going to the Mount of Olives, he was at the Garden of Gethsemane, right? More or less, the same, same area. So this wasn't the first time that he was there. He would go there to pray on a regular basis. So we look at the ancient path in the garden and then the path that Jesus walked in the garden. Mankind was doomed in the garden. Mankind was saved in the garden. I love that, that parallel there. That's the ancient path that we're supposed to walk, one that, that puts us with God. So we look at all of this. I mean, we look at the law that was given to Moses. I'm kind of backtracking a little bit, but we look at the law that was given to Moses. So the law was say, the Ten Commandments. You know, thou shalt not commit adultery. Um, you know them, the Ten Commandments. And then there are also the Levitical laws. There are a bunch of those. I can't name them. Sorry. I'm not the Scott, but there's hundreds of them. I, Leviticus 19.19, don't wear jeans and a cotton shirt. Um, so I'm, I'm breaking that one. I'll repent when I get home. But the law, the purpose of the law wasn't just to give us rules to follow. The purpose of the law was to give us a means to be reconciled to the Father. See, the law was put in place so that people had something to strive for and so that they were able to see that in their natural state, they couldn't measure up. They needed the Father. 
They needed Jesus. They needed Messiah. That was the promise. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law because in their natural state, they could never measure up, but it gave them a means to aspire to it. So, like, where is it? Colossians 2.14, the law was nailed to the cross. It's part of that verse. It was nailed to the cross. That doesn't mean that it's not relevant anymore. Yeah, the Ten Commandments are still, we should still listen to those. We shouldn't kill people. That's not nice. As you know, the teacher said when I was in kindergarten, do not hit your people. Um, we should still listen to those, but it, it means that we're no longer made inadequate by the law. See, people are inadequate in the, the face of the law. We're no longer inadequate by it. See, when we accept the perfect sacrifice that was Jesus. You all see that? that? That's a big deal. Yeah, you can cheer for that one. That's okay. I'll allow it. Um, yeah, that was, we have the opportunity to not have to live under that law anymore. Right? So we look at, at Jesus, who was a fulfillment of that law. When he died, we had the ability now to walk with the Father on a level that we haven't had before. I mean, we have the Holy Spirit with us. And he said that us having the Holy Spirit is better than what the prophets had. Yeah, I might not be calling down fire on people like Elijah was, but, <laughs> you know, the Holy Spirit's here. He can guide me on a daily basis. And every step that I take, I can be led by the Holy Spirit. That's that ancient path. See, John 5 19 through 20, this is what I want to emulate. This is who Jesus was. Jesus gave him this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son does also. It's huge, right? Jesus did everything that God wanted him to do and he walked like God walked. That's what we're called to do. We're called to emulate Jesus. Well, Jesus is emulating the father. Therefore, we're supposed to emulate the father in how we walk. We're supposed to do everything that we do with his permission. So we go back. I'm actually making it through pretty good now. I don't know what happened. I guess the energy drink kicked in. Um, so we, we walk with the Father like we were supposed to, and that's that ancient path that I was talking about at the beginning. Everything that we do should be with permission from the Father. All right? Let me see. Let me find it. I've got a verse here. John 10, 27. I love this. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's the voice of God, right? My sheep know my voice. They, li they listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I like to almost paraphrase what I'm reading when I'm reading it because it kind of pulls out different things. It makes me look at it differently. So I kind of inverted that verse and I read it like this. The sheep that don't listen to my voice they're not my sheep. If you, don't listen to my, if you don't listen to the voice of Jesus, you're not Jesus' sheep. Sorry, that's just that's what he's saying. He doesn't know them. Now, I know God's all-knowing, but this is the type of know where it's like an intimate knowing, like Joshua was talking about this weekend. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Yeah, if you're not listening to the voice of God, that's what he means. I don't, I don't know you if you're not listening to me and you're not following me. That's heavy. But I think about all of the times that I don't listen to the voice of God. And I'm not talking about in big things. I'm talking about in little things. This is a hot topic, so I hope I'm allowed to talk about it, but like voting. That's a big one. We, we think, I'm going to vote for who I think is right. Right? And that's, how, that's, that's what we do. We vote for the person that we see as the best candidate. That's how Saul got put in place. He had all the, the things on his resume that said he was the best candidate. It's not who God wanted. What God wanted was a David. They didn't even have a copy of David's resume. The father forgot he even existed. Um, he was out working in the field, and they forgot about him. That's the kind of king that God wanted, though. See why it's so important to trust in God? Relationships. That's a big one. Should I be in a relationship with that person? God will give you the warning signs, but are you going to listen closely? Because the heart wants what the heart wants, and sometimes we just go after things, and we're like, no, oh, we shouldn't have done that. Guilty. There are times when I should have listened to the voice of God because I was hearing it, and I ignored it because of what I wanted. I wasn't walking that ancient path that we're supposed to walk. And the little things. I mean, what if I lived a life? I keep talking about clothes. I don't know why. 
But what if I lived a life where, like, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, God, what can I wear? What, what do you want me, how do you want me to look today? I didn't do that today. Sorry, God, I should have. But, but we could ask that question, like the little things. God, what should I eat? God, where should I go this weekend? God, can I watch this show? Is it okay if I watch this show? Chances are, if you said, God, can I go on that website? We know what he'd say, so we don't ask that question. But everything that we do, we have the opportunity to listen to God. I look at Pastor Mitch. I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to be that guy that's just sucking up to the boss. That's not me. But I know that Pastor walks with God closely. And I, like I said, I want to be like Pastor Mitch. Because in everything that he does, he's seeking God. This dude prays so much. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> I mean, I, I live a life of prayer. where I, I pray a lot, but I can't just sit down for three hours and pray like Pastor Mitch can. I'm working my way there, but I want to be like that, where in everything that I'm doing, I can seek the answers from God. See, that's where you, you, you want to start. You could start well, but finishing well is a whole different, whole different ballgame. I want to finish well. I want to be able to say, Pastor Mitch, you're not even nearly finished, but I want to be able to say, hey, I've made it 44 years with God, and it's better today than it was 44 years ago. I want to be able to make it a year and say I'm better this year than, <laughs> than I was last year. Like, to me, that's a big win, but to 44 years, that's incredible, and that's walking that ancient path. So looking at this, I am way off of my notes, but we're good. I'm just going to trust God with that, so... Honestly, I'm going to wrap up pretty closely because I'm there. We talk about, I'm going to bring it full circle. We talk about when people try to trap you with questions. People say, hey, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? What does the Bible say? And then they throw that Leviticus 19.19 in there. Like, how do you respond? What I'm submitting to you is this. It is just as much, as much of a sin for me, a man, to marry another man as it is for me to marry a woman that God doesn't want me to marry. Because everything that I do should be with permission from the Father, just like Jesus did. You see? That's the life I want to live. And when you live that life, that everything I do is with permission from the Father, then it's going to be like the state of perfection that the Garden of Eden was in, because I'm walking that closely with God. I'm walking close with God like Enoch did. Where <laughs> Enoch wasn't doing anything that he shouldn't have done. He was listening to the Father. So the father is like, you know what? You don't even get to die. I'm taking that from you. I'm, you. Come on home. I want that. Might not happen, but I want that. I want to walk with God that closely. So I'm wrapping up because I think I've pretty much said everything I'm wanting to say. I want to end with this, the, the few questions. Ask yourself on a constant basis, just like God asked Adam, where are you? Ask yourself, where am I? Where am I right now spiritually? Am I at a place where I could hear the voice of God? Because like I said, the voice of God can be soft. And chances are, if you're not hearing the voice of God, this is where fasting comes in. You're eliminating things that are distractions. See, sometimes we do a fast, and we put the fast in front of God. Or I'm more concerned about the fast that I'm doing than I actually am about hearing the voice of God. Where are you spiritually? If you're not, do, do welfare checks. Pastor has told me that. Do spiritual wef welfare checks. Where am I spiritually? Can I hear you, God? If I can't, then there's a problem. I need to eliminate some things that are speaking louder than God is right now. And ask yourself, when you do something, who told me I could do that? Did my friend tell me I can do that? Did Justin Bieber tell me I can do that? Because, seriously, there are people that committed suicide because someone created a Twitter page that, from Justin P Bieber and said, hey, it's cutting for Justin Day. That happened once. People listen that they put that much stock in celebrities. I'll never meet a president. I haven't yet. Maybe I will one day. I haven't yet, but if I do, I won't have the opportunity to talk to him like I can with God. We have the opportunity to live a life where we're right in front of the creator of the universe, almighty Yahweh, on a daily basis. Right? Put some, put some weight in his voice. Like, like, listen to what he says. So my closing points. Identify the various voices in your life. Where do you hear God speaking to you? Where are there voices that are speaking louder than God? Are the voices that you're listening to pushing you closer or further from him? Think about this frequently. I'm surrounded by some awesome people. 
I'm surrounded by Joshua. I'm surrounded by Pastor Mitch. I'm surrounded by my mom, by Miss Ann, by Cameron, by Trevor, by Sean, by Mr. Bo. Thank you, Bo. You're the best. Um, but I'm surrounded by all of these people, and I know that they're hearing from God. So I can be comfortable around these people because when they're hearing from God, they might have something to tell me. Where are, are, are the voices that you're hearing pushing you closer or further? Surround yourself with people that are pushing you closer to God. And then know God. We talk about our vision at Victory, helping people become who God created them to be. And part of that means knowing God. It's important. You can't, like I was saying, you can't discern the voice of God if you don't know who he is. And we talk about hearing the voice of God like we've got the Bible. That's all the word of God. That's a good starting point. Listen to what the Bible says. That is the voice of God written down. That's just as important as the prayer time. So don't blow what I'm saying out of context where it's like, yeah, God told me I could do this and I'm doing completely what the word says not to do. Don't do that. I've seen those people. Don't do it. It's not a good look. Seek first the kingdom. Are you asking for the will of God in even the smallest areas of your life? Like I was saying, you're seeking the kingdom of God in your life. I'm not seeking what other people want me to do. I'm seeking the kingdom in these little choices. Do you value and place God's opinion over yours? A lot of times we try to reason things out before God. God said in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 55, don't quote me, but he said, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are greater than your thoughts. No thought that I could ever have up here can compare to any thought that God has. So if I'm reasoning things out for God, if I'm saying, well, God's love, he would let me love this thing that I shouldn't love. <laughs> he would let me enter into a relationship with someone that I shouldn't enter a relationship because God loves that person. I'm reasoning it out for myself. I'm not reasoning it out with God's logic. I'm not asking him what his logic was. Because by his logic, if you read the Bible, when Jesus rubbed dirt in someone's eye, if I went to a doctor's office and they did that, they would be going to a doctor's office as well. I would not be happy. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? God uses crazy things that could, he said it could confound the wise, right? God's logic is so far beyond ours that if we reason things out in our logic, we'll miss it by a long shot. And lastly, like, what are the areas that you, well, that's, that's it. Like, I think this way, therefore God does too. So identify those areas in your life. I guarantee we all have them where we try to think for God instead of listening for God. 